Flake.com was the portal for breakfast cereal. It was people, people were piling into the industry by the month. It was open up the paper and see 20 new businesses opened up every day and people were piling in. So uh, a majority of it was scams. They didn't actually sell breakfast cereal, but they had like information about it and they had like pictures of, of flakes and uh, recipes and things. People started to look at the numbers and the size that the internet could grow to. And they realized that, my God, Amazon.com could be as big as 10 Walmarts. Americans, and, and this is, this just encapsulates the whole thing right here. Americans spend more money each year on breakfast cereal than they do on music, than they do on CDs. I joined this company and I walk into an office, at least in New York, and then when I visited in LA, you know, three days later, first class, um, I walk into offices where in every office that you walk into, people don't know what they're supposed to be doing. And there were people who did this and made tons of money, and there were a lot of people who did this, made tons of money, and tried to hide it. And they're still trying to hide it. You guys are paying yourself a million dollars a year. This is the dumbest fucking thing I've ever seen in my life, you know? You expect this to, to succeed as a business? Oh yeah, we got Dell, we got Pepsi, we got this, we got that. I said, well then, you found some suckers. The thing is, nobody gives a shit about cereal. Like, you don't like read up on your favorite cereal and see how it's doing, and how it's, you know, it's like, it's just something you buy, you know? A bunch of guys, whacking yeah. off, <laughs> trying to get dates. Trying to get dates and trying to make some cash. Just like they like to. It's like singing in the shower and thinking you're great. That's what this was, you know? Everybody was singing in the shower and, and touching themselves and it felt good, you know? And, and they're thinking, you know what, it feels good, it sounds good, I must be good, you know? We knew probably six, seven months in, it was done. The gentleman across the table from me, I'll never forget it, he looks at me and he says, we're prepared to offer you $11 million. Hallelujah. In the mid-1990s came the World Wide Web, and with it, a whole new way of thinking about the economy and the workplace. And guys like me, your humble host, Chaz Mastin, suddenly got business cards that said things like, Internet Engineer on them. I gave up my job as a comic rap artist, it wasn't going too well anyhow, and I started playing the dot-com game. You see, I wasn't a kid anymore. Now, I had responsibilities. People depended on me and my knowledge. It changed my life. You see, I was getting paid for being a geek, which I usually did for free. See, what you got, you got a lot of like effects. You got like, you got phase effects. I was paying off my credit card bills, I was picking up bar tabs, I was going to conventions in Vegas, but like a million other people, my party didn't last. So uh, that was an indicator two weeks ago when that check bounced, but then I thought, oh, well, maybe he's getting some more in or something, but, uh, you know, he just sent out this email. I'll send it to you, too. It just says, you know, look, maybe some money's coming in early September, but... In the spring of 2000, the public markets lost confidence in the internet revolution. Dot-com stocks crashed, billions of dollars in venture capital evaporated overnight, jobs started disappearing, and I began to question my own faith in the internet economy. And so, with work getting scarce, instead of going to Europe or grad school like some former dot-comers, instead of trying to impress a new employer with my IT and biz dev skills, I went around our great nation and found out what happened to the dot-coms. What happened to the money, to the people, and to the dream of the new internet economy? And the things I found out are going to blow your mind. Speed. Communications revolution, scene one, take one. Action. The dot-coms weren't some obscure phenomenon, 
Over $5 trillion was poured into internet companies during the second half of the 1990s. How much is a trillion dollars? Well, we talked to some people, and it turns out that nobody knows. But a billion dollars, that's easy. You see, the program to develop the atomic bomb cost the U.S. government approximately $20 billion back in the 1940s. And then, over a 10-year period in the 1960s, the same amount, $20 billion, was spent to send a man to the moon. In 1999 alone, well over $20 billion in venture capital was poured into dot-com startups. So, in essence, each generation had a choice. You could end a war and usher in a new stage of civilization. You could explore the unknown and empower a generation. Or you could make a JavaScript rollover, which crashes most browsers. But back in the halcyon days of the net, money just kept pouring in, like it had for so many other technological innovations in the past. Historically, it does happen over and over again, all sorts of technologies. So this, there was nothing new. This was better publicized, probably, and maybe a bit more extreme. There may be mistakenly a view that there's something different about this boom than prior booms. And you know what? I don't think there is. If you look back through American economic history, the telegraph uh, mania in the 1840s was huge. I showed a chart of RCA. Uh, from 1923 to 1935. And if you go back to the 20s, radio was the transformational technology that really helped to change the shape of, of the American economy. The radio um, craze was what really pushed Wall Street in the 1920s. The 80s, the early 80s, there was the PC business. There, you know, the con not all of them were public, but the, the Epsons. This has been true with previous technological innovations in our country. The Coronas. Electricity. The railroad. RCA. Electricity. The Columbias. The car. The Eagles that went public for one day. Um, they went up and they collapsed. Then in the mid-80s, you had the Borlins, the Multimates, the Word Stars, the Ashton Tates um, with D-Base. Um, and they went up, and they collapsed. And all these industries, that you could argue that, sure, they crest a little too high, and then they crash. But you know that's the way the system works, because uh, you know money rushes in, because no one knows what the best profit opportunities are. And it has to be sorted out in sort of this, you know, the, the, in, in a competitive climate. Um, and, and no one really knows what consumers are going to want, and so it's got to be sorted out by the market. In many ways, there were a great number of parallels between radio and the Internet. Um, it created a national community at the time. It created a new entertainment form, a new information uh, medium. And the stocks reflected the enthusiasm that went along with that kind of industry. R RCA went from three on a split-adjusted basis in 1923 all the way up to 114 in 1929 and back to three by 1935, and RCA would only get back to 114 in about 1964 at the height of the color TV craze in which it also participated. So people rejected that analysis as flawed and suggested that there were no parallels and went ahead and, and bought internet stocks with, with reckless abandon. According to these business guys and Washington think tank gurus, this technology bubble thing has happened over and over again throughout history. But where did the money for this one come from? Because it sure didn't come from my bank account circa 1994. People had money, you know, because it came toward the tail end of what was a 10-year boom. And there was just a tremendous appetite for startups. And, and uh, you saw a lot of highly capitalized VC funds set up. And they were willing to make a lot of bets. You know, they, they threw a lot of money against the wall, hoping for the the big strike. As well, you had um, capital gains taxes being cut in 1978 and then 81. Suddenly it made a lot of sense to fund risky startup ventures that, you know, may make it big in the future. So you had these sort of regulatory and tax changes that occurred that caused venture capital to basically go from nowhere to about 50 billion dollars a year most recently. An incredible economy which was generating excess cash you had pension funds that at that point were fully funded, and so a lot of private equity coming to the hands of the venture capital community. And I think the, the internet uh, uh, and everything that surrounded it had a tremendous amount of energy to, to basically attract that kind of capital. And then you had people that saw the, 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 the Kleiner Perkins or the benchmarks, you know, putting in six figures into a, an eBay and making back nine figures. And they said, well, we're just as smart as them. And so they want to push the envelope themselves. And that's why there was this, this frenzy. So there was a feeding frenzy. You had a very open 
environment for investment in the country. We were in a period where there was deregulation, uh, a certain kind of uh, enshrinement of markets and capitalism, a lot of entrepreneurialism. You know, that's a very volatile brew. You put those things together, you get a tech explosion. Okay, money was there, but money is always out there. There was something different about this revolution, the speed with which it all occurred, enabled by the paradigm-shifting velocity of the new technology itself. The net grew faster than any technology in human history. It took 46 years for electricity to be in 30% of American homes, and 38 years for the telephone to be in 30% of homes, and 17 years for TV. But the internet did it in seven years. And right now, over 70% of Americans use the net. It's like a virus. It keeps spreading into your cell phone and your kitchen appliances and your toothpaste, and you just can't stop it. One of the things that, that we saw happening in, in 98 and 99, you know, as we were raising our money, is, is what was going on in this whole concept of internet speed. There's an argument, in fact, that you know, the industry grew too quickly, that initially 10, 15 years ago, the industry was small enough, they really could do good, careful research to see what was going to be the next big thing. But the money just started piling in so, so quickly that you know, it was hard to get you know, good expertise and do good due diligence across the board. In the internet world, if you planned out more than, than two quarters, you know, you were probably going to be toast. The speed uh, with which the, the, the bubble grew in, in the internet arena was a function of the technology itself. Uh, there were a lot of enabling technologies that allowed money to move far more quickly than it used to. And then the speed with which information is disseminated now also aided and abetted the process. I mean, with, with the advent of CNBC or Financial News Network before it, you had this real-time coverage of the financial markets that didn't exist in other periods. So things move so fast. and that. How could anybody, I mean, you had to be really, 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 really smart or a psychic to predict what was going to happen next. And the internet went from avatars to VRML to, you know, to um, JavaScript to Flash. Flash was going to change the way the internet was done. Streaming video was going to change the way it was done. MP3s recently were going to change the way the internet, you know, you know functions and, and uh, MP3.com and Napster, you know. All those things were going to change the world and they changed the world for about a month. So the net was fast, the markets were fast, investment was fast, and perhaps, just perhaps, people were drinking a little too much coffee to keep up. I've got this theory that that coffee really is to blame. Is to blame. It, it gets people very excited right. and, and uh, idealistic, and, uh, and also they want to invest money when they're drinking coffee. Uh, how, how big of a role do you think coffee played in, in, the, in the creation of the bubble? You know, I noticed that in February of 2000, everybody for some reason started drinking juice and not coffee, and then the market crashed. So I think you might be onto something here. I think it's true because you need energy to stay awake because all these internet companies had weird hours. You know, they'd always come in later in the day and they needed to kickstart the day. So they come in and kickstart the day and, you know, coffee kept them going through throughout the whole deal. I think the dot-com bubble and coffee are synonymous. Yet another coffee shop down the tubes. And I think it is definitely related. This is like corner of 23rd, the crossroads in the beginning of Silicon Alley. Starbucks and Red Bull, twin culprits. Uh, it's possible. I mean, I, th I don't think caffeine was behind the, the madness. I think, I think it was just sort of capitalist frenzy. Personally, I, I drink a lot of Red Bull. You know? The energy drink. Yeah, yeah. that's my drug. Yeah. Well, caffeine uh, and... Uh, I don't drink coffee because it makes me shit. <laughs> but I like That's Red why Bull. I drink coffee, though. <laughs> Phil, it's, it's great. I mean, it keeps you regular. Red Bull doesn't make you shit? No, Red Bull just makes me crazy. And I, and I take a lot of vitamin B12. They would get the, the supercharger, you know, which is like the death charge. It's a, uh, you know, um, regular coffee with, uh, it gets a shot of espresso in it. So that's the usual one. In the mid-1990s, investors were loaded to the gills with cash and looking for some place to put it. 
And one of the reasons the investors chose to put their money in dot-coms was because there were some early success stories that made them really believe it was a good ride to buy a ticket for. And nobody else made people believe in the potential of the net as a business medium, like Mark Cuban. This guy sold Broadcast.com to Yahoo in 1999 for nearly $6 billion. That's billion with, with a B. The company was four years old. After Mark Cuban cashed in on his Yahoo stock, he went and bought his favorite NBA team, the Dallas Mavericks. Mark Cuban. Yeah. Broadcast.com. Yeah, oh boy, he cleaned up, didn't he? Yeah, what was, what was the industry take on Broadcast.com? Because it was a little bit outside of Silicon Valley. Good deal, Mark. Do it again. Everyone we talked to says um, Mark Cuban was the guy that, that we looked to and said he was a success story. He was the Poor mythological. <laughs> <laughs> Poor guy. No, but you, you, were, you were the myth of, of the IPO and selling the company and, and making the billions of dollars. On, I was? On, on, <laughs> yeah. I am. I you, was. You are. <laughs> when you started Broadcast.com, what was the goal? What were you guys shooting for? The goal really was to try to create a, a broadcast network on, on the internet, and that's what we called ourselves. And, you know, we took, tried to take advantage of, of my sales and technology expertise to, we started out of the second bedroom of my house and started with a, a $2,900, like $3,000 Packard Bell PC and a $49 Super Radio and an ISDN line. We didn't have this big glorious plan, you know, it was keep costs low. I mean, our, our first office um, was 1500 well, 1500 grew to 3,000 square feet. Um, Reused furniture. This is the furniture I have from my very first business. Notice my chair is still broken like it was then. Um, the furniture you see over here was the same furniture. Um, we bought, you know, used chairs, and you know, our goal in hiring people was they had to be less than ten dollars an hour. Ten bucks an hour sure doesn't seem like a lot of money to me. But then again, if you had stock in Mark's company on the day of the IPO, you probably weren't complaining about your paycheck. What was it like the day that uh, the, you went public and your stock went from $18 to $62? It was, it was a pretty bizarre day. Um, you know, the night before, we knew that the demand was pretty solid, that it was, that was big, and, and we had to have the conversation of what we were going to price it at, $18 or $19, because there were rules on how much you could increase the price, and we'd already increased it from 12 to, to 18 and we kind of made a marketing decision that, you know, we knew because we were with Morgan Stanley and they had taken Netscape out that we had a chance to be the biggest IPO in history. That would be a great marketing event. So we, we rolled that dice and it worked for us. And, but even then, when, when we got up that morning, we went out and had a few cocktails that night. And then we got up that morning not feeling so well, but we went to the, the NASDAQ and that was the first time that they'd brought people in for an opening with their new NASDAQ wall that they've since moved. And so it was a big event for them. It was a big event for us. And you know, we were taking bets in the car about uh, where we're going to open, and I was the most aggressive, and I and I remember betting 34 bucks at the high end, and so it came 11 o'clock and 12 o'clock, and we hadn't opened yet, and they're telling us it could be higher, and we're like, oh my, you know, and then it, the ticker starts coming across, and it was like 68 bucks, 69, 72, and I'm like. Oh my lord. People are like, oh, we gotta go celebrate. I'm like, that's cool, but we gotta get the hell out of here. We gotta go to work. You know? They're, they're like, we gotta go have a party. When we get back, we're gonna have this. And I'm like, no, absolutely not. We're not gonna have a party to celebrate because we haven't done anything. You know, we convince people to buy a stock, but the company hasn't done anything. When you don't celebrate the IPO, that, that's not an accomplishment. You know, that just means people believed in you. And if they believed in you, it means you better damn well get to work for the ex expectations. The fact that we've had such a great IPO just means the expectations are higher. Mark Cuban built a business on sales, teamwork, and technology, and keeping the same broken office furniture since his first business in 1983. And once you make the big time, you're allowed to do stuff like buy a $40 million Learjet over the internet. You, you bought the jet over the internet. Um, did you fill out a form? No, you sent an email. I did all the research. I sent an email. I said, I want to buy it. Can I do a test drive? And they said, yeah. 
you know, and I said, okay, if I test drive it, I'll, I'll write you a check. Okay. They said, sure, we'll take your check. <laughs> it's that simple. So it wasn't like an add to cart kind of thing. No, well, no, no, no. It wasn't like, oh boy, this isn't a secure server. What am I going to do? <laughs> oh, no jet tonight, you know. <laughs> okay. People say, you know, what's your goal? What's your goal? My goal is to be sitting in front of an antitrust committee. Because <laughs> then I won, you know. You please, you know, people say, oh, poor Bill Gates. My God, poor Bill Gates, my butt, you know. That, that is the ultimate problem to have. That's just saying, I won. <laughs> now you have a problem with it, we'll deal with it, right? But I won. Meeting someone so successful and self-assured really made me feel terrible about my own career choices. So I decided to go back to the fundamentals in my interviews. Um, do you say uh, GIF or GIF? GIF. Good. Because GIF is peanut butter. Oh, see, that's a good reason not to say GIF. Yeah. GIF. Say GIF? Yes. You check to them. Like no, I'm just trying to think. I say GIF. You say GIF? Yeah. Graphic. Isn't it, well, I don't even know what it stands for. I say GIF. <laughs> How is it supposed to be pronounced? However you want it to be. Really? If, if GIF is good for you, I think that, that I it's think good. I think I've always said GIF. Yeah. Like the peanut butter. <laughs> I say, uh, GIF. Do you, uh, would you correct somebody if they said GIF? I think I would, yeah, definitely. <laughs> it's not the peanut butter, man. It's not the peanut butter. I say GIF files. GIF. I say GIF. GIF. That's good. Is that good? <laughs> well, I mean, it's good okay. that you feel yes! solid. Yeah. <laughs> the web was intended to be a cross-platform, bleeding-edge, real-time, vertical yet scalable, transforming, value-added, plug-and-play sticky e-market that had end-to-end -end branding functionality to monetize and leverage niche metrics through a click-and-mortar recontextualization of customized solutions that would morph, optimize, and repurpose frictionless front-end B2B and B2C out-of-the-box, yet mission-critical turnkey web-ready communities. And the architecture? Enterprise level. Alan Greenspan is the chairman of the private bank that runs the economy. In 1996, after observing the massive growth of tech and dot-com stocks under his watch, he warned that perhaps investors were suffering from what he coined irrational exuberance. This phrase has stuck as the most annoying I told you so of all time. You know, again, hallmark of a bubble is it always goes past the point of rationality. I mean, you know, Alan Greenspan in 1996 coined the phrase irrational exuberance, um, and he was early. I suspect the rationality of it was in the eye of the beholder. Uh, Greenspan is probably even more of a curmudgeon than I am, so for him it was irrational. Uh, for some of the younger kids in the dot-com world, it was utterly rational, which is a scary point too. I fall out somewhere between. I would say some of the decisions were probably irrational. I would go farther to say downright stupid. Bubbles of this size tend to be generational events, and it takes uh, a period that is long enough for the next generation to forget about the previous bubble, to duplicate that experience again. A lot of what went on in Silicon Valley in particular was the look, was the search for the next Netscape. Because Netscape really did take people by surprise. Um, it doubled, and there were, you can go back and look through the records of people saying, and talking about NetScam, and people saying it wasn't a business, and that Jim Clark was crazy, and that John Doerr was this and that. I mean, there, all that stuff existed then. No one paid any attention the minute that stock price doubled on the first day. What started with Netscape and grew through Yahoo reached a surrealistic, frenzied peak with the IPO of the Globe.com in late 1998. Yeah, Netscape was the beginning, and I think in some ways the Globe.com was the peak. Not, not in terms of time, but in terms of, you know, conceptually how the feeding frenzy got so great that, you know, mom and pop investor went out and paid $92 a share for this thing on the opening day, and the stock never went above that price. In fact, went straight down. 
The Globe.com had everything going for it, except for a feasible business plan. You had a company, a very questionable business model that was at the time the most successful initial public offering ever. Uh, and What was the Globe? What was that all about? That was a site that was started by two college kids at Cornell University and was basically a gathering place, an online community for, uh, with message boards and other activities. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it became very successful in terms of traffic uh, and it became very successful in terms of recognition and brand. Uh, there were lots of questions about how that would be turned into a revenue stream. But that was true of the internet overall. I can't point out the globe as being particularly uh, irrational in that sense. The real watershed between irrational exuberance and complete insanity was the globe IPO. That was it. Globe IPO, you know, through the roof. And, and everyone's like, what just happened? So that's when all of a sudden, like, everybody just went nuts and said, I want a piece of the globe or a tripod or Lycos or Yahoo or Amazon or whatever it was, was going to be bigger than the next for a really long time. I mean, it's like, what the hell is this? So then you had, you know, companies being formed that were just insane. Gazoon tight. <laughs> The dot-com bubble grew in every major urban area in every direction. Down south in Atlanta, Georgia, a couple of brothers cooked up an application called tourdates.com for bands to post show dates online for free. The Schaefer brothers, Rob and Alan, were able to sell tour dates to launch.com in the year 2000 for $11 million. And that's when the fun stopped. So when we would go out to California for meetings, we were... You know, smallest rental car. Smallest rental car. Cheapest room. Cheapest hotel rooms, and you know, take, making sure that there was a Saturday stay involved in all this. What morons we were! You know, the whole time we're doing this is our responsibility as shareholders. There are people that are, you know, at the drop of a hat, flying between New York and L.A. and spending two thousand dollars for plane tickets and staying at the place that Bill Clinton stays at for two hundred and seventy-five dollars a night on the beach in Santa Monica. And it was just, like, it was ridiculous. I peaked out at around five and a half million and closed out the account for about 160,000. Ouch. Even though the 12 and a half million dollar deal wound up being a several hundred thousand dollar deal, uh, you know, we thought we hit a home run. What we really, I guess what we really, we really got hit by a pitch. <laughs> but we still got, we still got on base. I met up with Sidhu Namakajo in Harlem. Sidhu used to work for Boo.com. Boo was a Swedish company that took about $200 million and tried to build a global sports brand. They had offices in 18 countries. But Boo didn't work. I mean, the site literally didn't function. Boo.com in Italy made one sale. It was for a $3 keychain, which was returned to Boo, costing the company $11 in shipping and handling. Boo suffered again, like I said before, like a, a series of little bad ideas. And you have enough little bad ideas, turns the whole thing into a big bad idea. One of, our, one of Boo's little bad ideas was um, an online character called Miss Boo. And what basically she was supposed to be, she was supposed to be the, the face of all the customer service reps. She was supposed to be this sexy little nymphette who would tell you what to buy and what not to buy. And at one point, they talked about how if you picked the wrong outfit, she would kick you off the site and tell you not to come back. Well, yeah. one of the ideas was that Miss Boo had to have the perfect hair. Um, so <laughs> Boo.com spent about $30,000 flying in one of these world-class hair, celebrity hairstylists to do hair on this flash animated fake character. So basically, they had a, a real-world hair designer kind of design hair for a cartoon. That's, that's excess. That's gross excess and irrational exuberance. That's what I would call that. It, it, it's not that it's excess. The seven meetings that you go to about her hair, that's excess. Let's talk about the air on chair. I began to be aware of the fact that these groups of very young, you know, entrepreneurs started showing up 
you know, regularly in the showroom, usually unannounced, usually without an appointment, and almost always because of the air on chair. I've walked into offices where everybody that works there has like a six, seven hundred dollar air on chair. I mean, really, does the guy who works in accounting need a seven hundred dollar chair to sit on? I mean, really, is that worth? I mean, well, it's a nice chair. It's a, oh, it's a beautiful it's, chair. They're but, great chairs. They're but great. when you get three hundred employees and you do the math, that's a lot you of go, money. Go, wow! You know, we spent a lot of money on making our offices look really cool and really high tech because we're a cutting edge company. So we got to look young. We got to look hip. The Aaron Chair from Herman Miller. Business Week's Design of the Decade. And the official chair of office hockey. We had 200 people in our office, and every one of them had one of those special chairs that are probably 800 bucks a pop. The Aaron Chair? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I guess that's what it is, yeah. The, the, the well-designed, really nice mesh, it cools your ass. The I mean, whole deal, the yeah, whole the deal, ass, yeah, that yeah. whole thing, yeah. Yeah. Let's get the ass cool and I forgot well, about everybody that. Everybody had one. Yeah. Everyone. 200 people, you know, and you're a startup. You're like, geez, that's a lot of money on chairs. You know, I mean, so. Well, they want you there, though. They want you sitting, working, so they're probably thinking, let's spend on the chairs. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Did you have one? Yeah, I had one. But it was nice. It was nice. Should, probably should have taken that home. The chair's kind of overwhelming to people. They come in and just say, oh, I don't want that. I, there's too much to do. But in reality, it's just a really simple thing because if you just drop your arms down at either side of the chair, you're touching every adjustment there is. The air on chair. Excess. But the fact that the adjustments are right there makes it very, very easy either to adjust the height or to adjust the tension. Just roll this wait, knob. Wait, wait, I, I, let's start with the, oh, the height is down here, right? No, no, the height's right here. Okay. Yeah. So now lift your weight up oh. and bring the chair right up behind you. Oh, I see. Okay. What did you do, break my chair? I, there, there are people who are just air on mechanics. That's all they do. They come in and if you say like, I want the arms replaced or some of these have like a tilt forward like option, which they don't all have. Mm -hmm. Oh, you see, I need one of those because I can't work on my computer. I, I, I might have broken it. I think you broke my chair. Wait, maybe I have the, uh, the other thing on. No, that wouldn't affect the height adjustment. Okay, this man has broken my chair. I, I... Look at my chair. See, my chair works perfectly. <laughs> my chair lowers. Oh, there we go. There we go. There we oh, go. see? Okay. My Aeron chair was medium size. I had the large size, but I thought that might it, it promote secretary spread, so I changed to the medium size. And um, it had quite a good amount of bounce, just the right amount of bounce. Mm -hmm. <laughs> On the other side, yes. you know, you see, I'm already have this forward knob pulled mm -hmm. up, and that's because I like to have a little extra rock, and this is the forward five degree. Now, if I'm going to sit at the computer, and I really want to be you know, kind of locked in a forward position so that I have really good lumbar support. I can sit in this locked position. I don't use my computer all day, so I don't sit this way. I unlock the chair, you hear that little disengage, and then I leave it in the forward five degree because I like. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 The clearest examples of dot-com excess were the launch parties. These were wildly extravagant affairs costing upwards of a million dollars, showcasing the likes of George Clinton, Prince, Depeche Mode. But if your goal is to get the most attention and thereby get the most financing, then having a big flashy party sort of makes a lot of sense. There were a lot of big companies in New York City. Oh, yeah. And uh, you were a reporter. You went out to a lot of these launch parties. What were they like? What was a typical launch party like? Huge. And a um, space about 10 times this size. You know, DJ so loud you couldn't even hear it. But, you know, but no one's dancing because everybody's too busy handing out business cards. That sort of thing. I mean, we were partying like rock stars, chartering boats in the British Virgin Islands, going on shopping sprees in New York. There was no launch party. 
There was no launch party. You know, it's incredible. We talked to these other companies that they raised a hundred million dollars. They had a huge launch party with George Clinton and, and you know all these other musicians, and, and then they were gone within a year. Yeah, that's part of the, that's part of the mistake. There were, there were companies that were being run uh, for the excitement of the business rather than the, the business fundamentals. Like Concrete Media, for instance, had this party where you walk in and everyone's like in this these like garage mechanic suits in yellow, and they were like, you walk in and there's candle lights all over, like everywhere, and they're like. To the right is a sushi bar, to the left is a massage, and the vodka bar is in the far corner, and then a regular bar. And then there's smoke and a dance floor going on, and sushi chefs, and then massage chairs. And I'm like, maybe that's why they went oh out Oh my of god, sushi. yeah, no, no doubt. They had a launch party and they had the B 52s there. I used to go out four or five nights a week um, between what was going on in Silicon Valley and all the craziness in San Francisco. It got to the point where I stopped going to launch parties because there were too many. Upper management of our company allegedly was, you know, having sex. At, at the party or after the party or something like that with with uh, lower rung employees in the company and things that were just stupid, things you don't do. I drank a lot of bad white wine, let me tell you. Really? Yeah, although the wine in Northern California is pretty good. Every year, Windstar would go on the road and do something called a road show where they would travel from city to city to companies that they, um, or cities that they were doing business in. And it was basically this extravagant, lush, um, glad handing type of thing where the top management guys would come on stage and say how great it is and how much revenue we're going to make and we're going to be the next day OL and we're well on target for EBITDA positive and there'd be this lush buffet of you know, seafood and meat and it was drinks and it was great and last January, end of January, early February we uh, had one and it was wonderful and two months later they filed for bankruptcy. <laughs> I went to some good launch parties in my day. I ate a lot of chilled shrimp, but I never saw anything like the launch party they had for IM.com. And there were, I don't know how many invitations, but there was a PR company that was hired by IM.com to put together this party and make sure that it was like the smash event of the Oscar week out in Los Angeles. In order to start the party, they started off with like skin props in the... Yeah. In the in the, the party, these, these look, are people. These are, these are like hired, out, of, out of work actors who are hired, hired hands that look a specific way to make the party look like it's cool. And yeah. when the party gets full, they, they file out. So but they, they're there to make it look great. Right. They gradually leave. Yes. So they gradually leave. It's like the, the, the party is full from quiet. like 6 p.m. and like it's just like a few of them leave as more people show up, and then a few more leave. So this party is going from the beginning. It's I mean it's like a, like what they do for an Academy it's Awards party. It's a good party. thing. It's yeah. a good thing, but you know, expensive. <laughs> <laughs> what about the venture capitalists? Did they well, get in? I mean, unfortunately, they weren't my duty to get into the party. <laughs> the, 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 the VCs. Okay. No, no, no. I didn't. I the fee, yeah. the VCs were somebody else's responsibility, but it was the same problem. So you can imagine, you know, forty-eight million dollars later, these guys who have put all this money in, they can't get into the party because these party promoters won't let them in the door. Spend that money. Fourteen dollars an hour. Do you know how much fourteen dollars an hour was to me? That was like a million dollars. Started ordering hundred dollar shots of cognac. They went and they spent a couple hundred thousand bucks trying to develop a new logo. Upwards of thirty-five million dollars. Tens of thousands of dollars. Sixty grand, you know, ninety k. But still half a mil, right? Then we could generate sixty million dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars, two hundred million dollars, three and a half million dollars, twelve million dollars, two hundred, four hundred, six hundred. <laughs>
personally because I was, I was in a position where I had teams. You know, I had people that worked with me or that that I had worked with on so many projects and had gone through the whole blood, sweat, and tears thing. And, and you know every day going into work that something's going to happen. You know that no one's telling you that it's going to happen. You know that you're not being given options about your own career. Um, a lot of people were given opt-outs. And, and I think that given that opportunity, the situation may have been different. But every day, it was every day for maybe two months of just coming into the office wondering if today's going to be your last day at work. Then the day before the first round of layoffs happened, um, whispers started. Someone from senior team accidentally said something in the men's room or blah, blah, blah. And um, sure enough, after work, everybody's going out to talk about this and is it really going to happen finally? And we've been waiting and why isn't anybody telling us this? And we would have these meetings with management, no, everything's fine we're not going to have layoffs. They look you right in the eye and say, no, everything's fine. We're not going to have layoffs, you know. And I said to him that I have a little brother who is Down syndrome and he's in school and I pay for his school and I'm able to pay for his school because of my job and, and that I can't, I can't work day to day like this worrying about taking care of him and I can't let my family keep worrying. I mean, we were for so many months just a mess. Everybody wondering what the next day would bring and if, if we would have to take John out of school or, you know, who knows what. And, and it wasn't a sacrifice I was willing to make. That's the one thing I've committed to in my life that I need to make happen. Did, uh, did he tell you eventually before you were laid off? He didn't even tell me the day I was laid off and this was January 18th and uh, I had a phone message that our you know, chief managing officer or whatever his title was wanted to see me in his office and I went down there and he said only have five minutes I have to go and I'm like I need to know what's going on I don't want to go through the day like this he said, I can't talk about it now, and he left and went to a meeting, and he didn't come back. So at uh, maybe lunchtime, I inquired again, and he didn't come back. And then maybe 5 o'clock that day, I was called into Human Resources. Working for a dot com, something you're going to do again? Never. <laughs> uh, I would also be very distressed at the way at which uh, a lot of these dot coms have been, uh, you know, handing out the pink slips. I heard that one of them sent an email and uh, asking all the employees to report to a certain conference room in a hotel across the street in 15 minutes. Or uh, some people were not, uh, some companies which didn't even tell anybody. And uh, yeah, the, the manner in which everything is carried out without a, f a proper explanation or an apology, I think an apology was required. If, uh, if I were the CEO of a failed dot com and I was laying off people, I would probably call out uh, the people who I'm laying, laying off and tell them that I'm very sorry for all the promises that I made to you. I'm sorry I could not keep them. And uh, uh, that's how probably I would do it. So I don't have a job anymore and I don't have any money. I didn't get any severance when I got canned, but I stole a lot of shit in the office before I left. You know, I used to wonder about these people who'd be like hanging out like on a Tuesday afternoon looking like they got nothing to do and nowhere to go and being like, what's their deal? Not one of those people people wonder about. So I woke up on the late side because I can't seem to sleep at night anymore for a variety of reasons. 
When I finally got out of bed, I stared at the wall for a while and drank some coffee and stared at the wall. Then I went on my computer and fucked around and looked at stuff and, like, typed stuff for breakfast or whatever. I ate some fudge-striped cookies and Pringles. Then I relaxed and watched some TV for a little while. Around noon, I decided to try and figure out what the hell I'm going to do about this whole no-work-no-money situation. I thought about trying to, like, figure out some kind of scam to make some quick money, but I couldn't really think of anything good. Then I thought about how I should really, like, do some volunteer work, you know, and, like, help out with the community. And the fact that I seriously considered volunteering made me feel better about not volunteering. After that, I spaced out for a bit and fantasized about what I'm going to do after I win the lottery. Then I decided I was going to write, like, a movie script. But after, like, a half page or so, I got kind of bored, and I found out it's really hard to write, like, a whole movie. So I turned to TV for inspiration. Then I had what you'd call, like, a panic attack. I freaked out about ending up living in a box on the street or moving back in with my parents into, like, my old room with, like, my sports banners and trophies and Def Leppard poster. Finally, around, like, 2 o'clock, I got the motivation to, like, go outside and stuff. But outside is kind of hard when you have no money. It's like you can't buy any ice cream because you have no money, and you can't go shopping because you have no money. When you're not, like, working, you start to realize how money is, like, really important and stuff. So I put myself on a tight budget to make sure I save money for the essentials. I heard about all the loads of money people were making selling off the assets of dot-coms. And so I went down to Northern Virginia to check out one of the auctions. They were selling everything. Servers, chairs, routers, the company's welcome mat. Okay, I'll admit that at first I thought of these people selling and buying this equipment as vultures, picking at the bones of my generation's dreams. But then I realized that maybe I was laying the metaphor on a little thick here. And that these were just businessmen trying to make a buck off of other people's foolishness. We're here to take a look at uh, the dot-com fallout and see uh, what type of technology is out there, what's available, what they purchased. What we're finding out is uh, with other people's money, uh, the dot-coms really bought a lot of high-quality uh, merchandise. <laughs> Started out, got an opening bid from the internet of four hundred dollars. Seventy five, five hundred dollars. Five hundred dollars. Six hundred dollars. Four hundred dollars. Seven. Seven hundred dollars. Seven hundred dollars. Take as many as you want. Six hundred dollars. Seven hundred dollars. We are the recyclers. We're taking product that once was uh, very useful to, to one company and turning it into product that's going to be very useful to another. We have been very, very busy selling dot coms. We've sold about 50 dot coms, technology companies, telecom companies. Virtually, we've seen the whole ripple effect of the internet implosion, and we're essentially recycling assets. There's a misconception in the marketplace that used assets don't have any value. You always hear the term five cents on the dollar, ten cents on the dollar. Well, the fact is that um, what makes the dot-coms a little unique is that there's really not that emotional attachment to the assets. Usually you have an entrepreneur who's come in with a great idea, got a bunch of venture capital money, flew high for a year or two, and uh, the thing bombed, and now he's on his way to another project. It's nothing personal. That's not the way it used to be. We actually had a, an auction that we advertised, we organized, and it was all the way up to the night before the auction. We got a phone call around 6 o'clock, and they said, you know, we have, might have to take a few of these items out because we lease them, we don't own them. And then about 10 o'clock they took some more out, and then about 11 o'clock they said, you know, we don't own any of this stuff. And so we had to pull the auction. Bill Kaplan is an opportunist, but at heart, he's a techie, he's a programmer. He's the kind of guy who remembers the name of the first color JPEG porn file he ever got off to. As the bubble burst, Phil, under the screen alias PUD, started a site called Fucked Company that has chronicled the dot-com flameouts in a way that only the net can, with inside information, a dot-com Deadpool game, and hundreds and thousands of obscene, yet poignant, anonymous postings. Let's start by figuring out, or just talking about, uh, how Fucked Company came about. 
Uh, Fuck Company pretty much started uh, as a joke. It still kind of is a joke. It's a Deadpool game sort of based on the classic celebrity death pool and you can pick which dot-com companies you think are going to go out of business and what's going to happen to them and, and you can accumulate points and play against your friends. Um, and then to, to award points, I would have to always like sort of write the news. And so, but not so much the news, I would write two sentences saying, you know, this company laid off 100 people, this company did this, this company did that. And, uh, and I wasn't trying to make a news site, I just needed to say like, oh, this is why you got points if you picked, you know, Priceline or something like that. Um, meanwhile, people used to just come just to read the little quips that I would write, and, uh, and the game sort of became secondary. So now the, the main focus of the site are just the little pieces that I write. For $75 a month, you can read all of the tips that I get uh, unfiltered, or you can search through all of them. How's that going? I mean, as a That's business, going, how's Fuck Company? Uh, so far, um, there are about 1,200 subscribers, so it's bringing in about 90 grand a month. That's great. Yeah, I'm happy. And it looks like you don't have a lot of overhead here. It's, uh... No, I have no overhead at all. I, I do the whole site myself. I, and I wrote the site in about a weekend, um, spent a couple hours every day updating it. Uh, it's a lot of fun. It, did you have to do any promotion to make the site popular? I sent it to, to six of my friends when I launched the site, and, and it, about a week later there were 20,000 people signed up. It turns out that a wide variety of people made money off the failure of the dot-coms, including the Scrapophilists. I'm a Scrapophilist. Uh, Scrapophily is the hobby of collecting antique stocks and bonds. And I've been collecting my whole life. I've been selling out here for five years. And uh, basically the idea is you, is you buy a canceled or a worthless stock in a company of your choosing. Uh, I have over 5,000 different companies. So every time a company goes out of business, it increases business for you? That, yes, yes. And you got some dot-com stocks for us? We do, we do. We have eToys. eToys, okay. beautiful. Which is definitely worth more dead than alive. Okay, this is selling on the internet for $150. Wow. We have egghead.com. We had a whole slew of them, but we sold most of them out. Well, people are buying up the They're old They're buying stocks. old, yes. Well, they buy everything, but uh, in particular, because the dot-coms are scarce, because not too many people thought of, A, buying it when it was on its way down, and, and B, getting delivery of the certificate, which involves more brouhaha. Like, you have to pay extra. You have to pay uh, a certificate fee and pay the brokerage. So when it's down to like a dollar a share or 50 cents a share, you don't want to pay like $15 to the broker and another $50 for the certificate. So most people just like shine it on and it ends up becoming a rare collectible. What a time to go to work. Well, at least we can't some place to go at 7 in the morning. Hey, what's Mr. O'Loughlin doing down here? Good morning, fellas. I wanted to get hold of it before you got into your uniforms. This is the day the electricians are going to start working on the elevators. As you must have known for a long time, we've been planning on putting in automatic elevators. I hope you've made plans. Take the day off. See the girl, she'll give you a paycheck. And, uh, I'm sorry. Good luck. Nationwide, the wave of dot-com failures also swept away hundreds of thousands of non-internet related jobs in businesses that were left holding contracts with defunct dot-coms. And the dot-com failure contributed to the recession that began in 2001. And in New York and around the nation, former dot-com employees sought comfort and potential employment in a new cultural phenomenon, the pink slip party. <laughs> In uh, 2000, the company that I was working at uh, lost its funding. We had a party. We, I, I put together a party because I was like the company cheerleader and I said, we can't let say goodbye this way, let's have a wake. So we had an Irish wake and basically we invited everybody who'd ever worked at the company. Interns, to contributors, to editors, to advertising people and clients. And we said goodbye, we said goodbye the right way. We laughed, we cried, we had a roast. It got ugly, but it was fun. Anyhow, went off to Italy, snowboarded, did my own thing, you know, found myself, whatever you want to say. Just needed, you know, I slept for two weeks straight. After I got home, I was kind of tired, so I decided to take like a 20 minute power nap. But it like ran kind of long. 
came back and decided, you know, I could do something very similar to the wake that I threw for my old company for, uh, you know, other dot commers who thought, you know, they sort of lost their job and maybe lost their way. And, you know, sort of like bring back the aura of what was special about being a dot commer, but say goodbye the right way. So first party we had was uh, in July of 2000 and it was sort of in instantaneous because out of nowhere, recruiters came to the party. I didn't even invite these guys. I don't know how they found out about it, but they found out about it. Because back then, the employment market was so red hot, tight. You could not, like, there were no bodies left to put in any company. So like, you know, a layoff, a company imploding was like a cheer at every other company. Split parties are for people who. Well, they're for the entire community, not okay. just people who have been, you know, downsized or pink slipped. They're for the entire dot com community, and that's one of the things that we're trying to do here is bring together the community and all of the communal resources. What are these? Recognize. Ooh, yeah. Pinks are for pink slippers. They're okay. bracelets. Okay. Green are for recruiters. Okay. And blue are for friends and supporters. Okay, can I have one of the blue ones? You can have anyone you want. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> Visual Basic and ASP programming, anybody? Yes? Give me a card. I don't have a card. I'm just visiting my life. Do you live in New York? I'd like to, yes. Okay. How are you going to remember this? Penny Hart at AOL. Okay. P E N N Y H A R T. Okay. Do I say GIF or GIF? Yes, I say GIF. You say GIF, okay. Yeah. Good. Graphic. I can't remember what it is. I say GIF. Yeah, I, yeah. GIF is a peanut butter. I know. A GIF. You say GIF. Yeah. Would you correct somebody if they said GIF? No. What? I used to say GIF, but now I say GIF. You say potato, I say potato. I sometimes I go back and forth. What's the proper pronunciation? GIF. No, no, I don't really care. I would correct someone if... Um... How about if they say GIF? Yeah, definitely GIF. Definitely GIF. GIF and GIF, that's okay. The fuck are you talking about? <laughs> well, do I say GIF or GIF? GIF. It's GIF? Oh, I say GIF. I like, I just like GIF better. Okay, you, you wouldn't correct anybody, though. Oh, I wouldn't correct anybody. No, if you wouldn't say GIF, absolutely. They're wrong, but, it, but GIF's a much cleaner, clearer, easy way to say it. <laughs> it's a GIF. GIF? Mm-hmm. Are we right? <laughs> yes, you're right. Congratulations. <laughs> Blame is a fascinating concept. For instance, who's really to blame for, say, Rocky V? Sylvester Stallone, or the people who went and saw Rocky IV? Maybe we won't ever have a good answer about who's to blame with the dot-coms, but this shouldn't stop us from pointing fingers. I know there are tons of fingers being pointed around. It's the public that's responsible. The reason the public is responsible is people started to look at the numbers and the size that the internet could grow to. And they realized that, my God, Amazon.com could be as big as 10 Walmarts. It was every kid in high school. It was every, every uh, you know, everyone you found um, on the street had some master plan for ruling the universe. Here's what happened. Uh, the people responsible for the whole mess were the venture capitalists and the marketing people. We have a mandate from the company, spend. In fact, I think that's uh, probably the uh, post-millennial thing, is you're not in it to make money. You're in it to waste other people's money. I have teenagers, and teenagers believe that an allowance is merely an open-ended funnel for their device to get money, uh, and there is no cap to it. And many of these entrepreneurs struck me eerily, although I didn't say that to them at the time, as, as my teenagers. There will always be more money because people will want to give me more money. And uh, I don't necessarily have to earn it, it's just my reward for existence. There is a, definitely a big scam element to it. Um, I think that there are a lot of entrepreneurs and investment banks and salespeople um, and uh, lawyers and lots of people in the game that knew that these companies were never going to be profitable. And they had no intention of actually re building real businesses. What they did have intention of doing is pumping up their stock and making money through 
the Wall Street game and, and selling it to you know your mom and dad's pension fund and you know our college stock fund and things like that. And so there are a lot of people who did that game who really didn't really build real businesses. So at one point I went to San Francisco and I'm, I'm, I'm at this bar with some friends of mine and this guy comes up to me and he goes, hey, are you the guy who runs fuckcompany.com? I was like, yeah, you know, hey, nice to meet you. And he goes, and he gives me his car and it was like CEO BBQ.com. And I was like, oh, sorry. <laughs> like, I just wrote some awful things about you, <laughs> about your company. He's like, no, man, it's cool. Like, I totally like your site. I, you know, I have 10,000 points. It's really fun. And I was like, all right, so like now that you're cool, um, like what were you thinking, you know? Like, what was this? And he said, uh, he said, you know, he goes, I love barbecue. Your right to exist as a corporation is driven by your ability to return something to your shareholders. Whether your shareholders are public, uh, private, or some hybrid thereof, that's your right to exist. Pets.com going public was the beginning of the end. Dog food FedEx to your house. First to bat, the venture capitalists. That that's just who they are and what they do. They're gamblers, okay? So they put their chips in 10 slot machines, expecting that nine of them are gonna come up lemons. But the one will pay for them all. You see, the thing is, is that they had such a long, lucky streak that they grew crazier and crazier and crazier until they weren't just betting on a few slot machines, they were placing bets on every table in the house simultaneously. I really believe it starts with the venture capital community. There's no question that VCs were, many of them, not all of them by any shot, but many of them were, were spread too thin to be able to add the value, contribute, and manage the companies that they had helped invest in and help grow. They didn't have the bandwidth. They didn't have the bandwidth. Um, well, there's the smart VCs and there's dumbass VCs. And, you know, when, when you're either and you get lucky, then it's a lot easier to be a dumbass because you, you, you start playing a numbers game. You know, one out of 10, one out of 20, all it takes because the hits are so big, you know, you just throw it up against the wall and see what sticks. And so the VCs put money into people based off a of concept, you know, based off of domain names, please. You know, they, they got exactly what they deserved. If you go into a, a, a crack house and you know, and you think you're gonna find the girl of your dreams, you're gonna be surprised, you know? They got exactly what they deserved. There's a great line in the movie Body Heat. I don't know if you remember that movie, but- I remember the movie a okay. little bit. Well, Mickey Rourke is this arsonist and he's sitting up on the bunk bed and the music's blasting as William Hurt is trying his hand as a lawyer who wants to blow up this building. And finally, Mickey Rourke turns down the music and he says, you know, if there's 50 ways to fuck up a crime, and you can think of 30, you're a genius, and you ain't no genius. I think that's the venture business. There's 50 ways for a venture to go wrong, and you've got to think of at least 30, and know whether you can manage through those and whether acceptable risk or not. Um, and then the other 20 you'll deal with as they come. It wasn't just VCs who get a bad rap. CEOs and entrepreneurs are also painted as bad guys. But there's a thin line between evil and confused. Many and many of these companies saw they were in trouble, and they reached for the accelerator and they punched the accelerator hoping that they would impress a new round of funding or impress a potential acquirer and they blasted into the brick wall. You had too many people who were the so-called experts, the VCs who were giving you the money, Wall Street who was giving you the money, saying, you know, go out and spend the money and build yourself the mind share you need to succeed to be that number one in the long run. The guys that were building it, they were in the trenches fighting the fight and doing the war and knowing everything about technology and how the markets were going, we're young kids, you know? Um, uh, you know too I, young? Too young. Venture capitalists and others relying too much on the management of people who were, you know, probably too young, not because they weren't bright, not because they didn't have a good vision, uh, but simply because, you know, when it comes through managing through difficult times, they haven't been there before. I kind of like poke at the people who, who dare to say that these kids and, and these grown-ups and these adults did not really apply themselves because they may not have had the best business plan, they may not have been focused on all the right things and growing a business, but no one can ever say that they didn't work hard to make that, those businesses work. Uh, I believe the techies are the drones of the new order. And so, uh, you know, everybody needs to give good tech at some point. And the techies will always find a place to go because people need good tech. And now, a few words from the drones. Look at the internet. Who do you think built that? It wasn't the CEOs, you know? 
Somebody had to fucking build the thing. I think that the problem was simply that, that uh, uh, you know, there's no barrier to entry on the internet. You and I can open up a web design company with $50,000 or $5 million. And there's no necessary correspondence between the amount of money that we get and the quality of work that we get. We have a mandate from the company, spend. And we spent. And spent. And spent. <laughs> and spent. And now there's nothing left to spend because it's all gone. You know, you, you read these stories about uh, dot-com people who are at homeless shelters. It's like, go get a job at McDonald's. I mean, there's just, it doesn't make any sense. They you can't can, get options, though. I know. <laughs> there were these huge consulting firms that popped up in the 1990s to help dot-com spend their cash quicker. They built the websites, they helped with the marketing, and made sure that the client believed at all times that they were worth the millions that were spent on them. These were the consulting and design firms like Razorfish, IXL, and March 1st. I figure it would be smart to talk to my brother Peter about them, since he saw the growth of IXL from the inside as a programmer and a manager. And luckily for our movie, he'd just recently been laid off. Um, well, he, he, there's some things I don't understand here about, about what happened. Okay, the, the consultants are making all their money off of these, these sites. Right. Um, but by charging these sites as much as, as they can possibly charge them, um, they, they're, they're sort of, you know, they shortened the, the run of the internet and shortened, in fact, their own lives, right? Well, I don't think anybody viewed it as, uh, as there being any end in sight. I don't think that people who were in the situation in 99 or 98 were thinking, you know, was thinking, hey, this thing's going to end, we better get ours quick. It was that there's no end in sight. There's going to be a never-ending train of dot-coms who want to do, you know, come and do business because, it's not like, phys the internet's not like physical space, right? There's an infinite number of, you know, e-shoe stores that could be on the internet. Web consulting firms bankrupted a lot of companies. The prices for the services they were getting were outrageous. But when they, when they started, nobody knew that. You know, nobody knew what something cost. Who knew what it took to make a website? Or who knew what it took to build the back-end shopping cart for an e-tail business? Who knew? Most senior executives in these larger companies still had secretaries printing out their email for them and putting it in folders. That tells you how much they, how technical savvy they were. And they would come to us because we did know and if we didn't know we would say we knew and figure it out. So could they be overcharged? It was like, it was like selling whiskey to the Indians. Okay? It was easy. <laughs> Do you feel you were overcharging? I remember at one point, I only speak personally for myself, um, I remember at one point my hourly rate was three seventy-five. What was it like? It was like uh, the, it was like the Lucille Ball pie conveyor belt routine. It was like the, the, the dot coms were coming down a conveyor belt and we were just trying to get them off and out the door as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. And if you're familiar with that, that shtick, there, a lot of pie got spilled. There was a lot of pies that went off the end of the conveyor belt and yeah. just dropped on the floor. That's a good story, but I, I, it was candy, it wasn't pies. It was pies, it was pies. Out, no, it wasn't pies, I mean, I saw the episode, it was candy, she it was, was dipping candies. It was pies. The financial analysts told people which hot stocks to buy during the bubble. Now, the analysts are being investigated by the government because some of their aggressive recommendations appear, in hindsight, to lie somewhere between ill-informed and shady. It's easy to have 2020 hindsight. Maybe the analysts did what they did the best they could, or maybe they pumped and dumped. Well, most of the government investigation is with the uh, Wall Street analysts. Um, and I think it raises an important question, which is that investment banking and research were supposed to have a Chinese wall. It was clear, as somebody who listened to the pitches on selecting investment bankers, that the Chinese wall had become a Chinese menu. You want the cash flow story, you want the PE growth story. Uh, so they had been completely blurred. And to the extent there's a, there's a perception, although I don't know with who, that the analysts were objective, uh, then I think that's got to get corrected. What role did the media play in this? Well, less, I think, than, than some people would suggest. I mean, I, I don't believe the media necessarily fanned the flames. I mean, we were responding to audience interest in many ways. I mean, there, the, you could not argue uh, that, that viewers and investors, individual investors, 
weren't interested and we somehow turned them on to internet investing um, by virtue of talking about it. I mean, there was a huge demand uh, for information on internet investments. There was an enormous demand to hear from high profile analysts who would later be vilified uh, for their role in the internet bubble, but everybody wanted to know where Amazon was going. Was it going to 200, 400, 600, 1,000, whatever the ultimate you know, projection was? And, and people just wanted to hear that. And once they heard 1,000, they bought more of the stock. There were tons of people that rushed in thinking that the whole world and the whole economy had changed, and there was a ton of money out there. And frankly, the media fed that. We saw all these examples of kids getting rich overnight, and tons of people flocked into this because it looked so easy to make money. The venture capitalists would fund a company. The company would buy a lot of advertising in one of the, the new age publications, new business publications. Those publications would have that much more money to invest in hiring new reporters who would go and cover new industries that the venture capitalists would read about. And they, they were all scratching each other's back simultaneously. And it was clear that all of this grew in concert. So now we've heard from all the players in the game. But what about the men behind the curtain, the investment banks? Here's how investment banks made huge profits on the IPOs. The investment bank was the casino. Institutional investors and VCs were the big money players. And the dot-com IPO was the game. What happened was, the investment banks told the big money players where to bet, knowing that the greater fools, the public investors, would come in and place money on the same tables. What the institutional investors got back was big money when they sold their stock on the first day to the latecomers. And in return, the investment banks, like Credit Suisse First Boston, received a kickback of up to a quarter of the profits from the IPO. Frequently, when a company's taken public, only a little bit of the stock is sold on the markets at that time. And those shares were rising a lot in value. And so it was very desirable to be able to get those shares. And that put the investment bank in a very enviable position because they would typically control who got the shares of the initial public offering. So there's a lot of questions about the, the techniques they used in allocating those initial shares. The investment banks are like Santa Claus, little boy, only they come every day. Okay. And they take 7% off the top. So that's the only bad thing about this Santa Claus. The fact is that Wall Street aggressively dropped its underwriting standards during the height of the internet boom and anything could come public. I mean you could get money for any concept at all. Didn't matter if it was a great business model. If it had an internet component to it, if it had dot com at the end of the name, you were in. The U.S. Attorney's Office has alleged, and this is all the Wall Street Journal, um, has alleged that Credit Suisse demanded not only aftermarket purchases as they're called, but also very high uh, commissions. So for example, the standard broker's commission is a couple of pennies on the share. But if, when you're trading, you're trading 10,000, 20,000 blocks of stock, it comes up to a nice buck, okay? Credit Suisse First Boston is alleged to have demanded in excess of that up to a dollar, and in some cases they say higher, per share per, per trade. Really? Yeah. That is also illegal. When Credit Suisse got busted for these kickbacks, as this movie goes to print, they settled with the SEC and the NASD for $100 million and the investor lawsuits against them and other investment banks haven't even begun yet. The VCs, investment banks, and sell-side analysts need to be held accountable because they actually understood what was going on with the bubble, but they did it anyway. That being said, they weren't robbing banks here. They were just doing the American thing, making something sound a whole lot better than it actually is. It's that concept that plays upon the most basic of human emotions, greed. Greed is the hot air that makes a bubble float. But greed doesn't make us bad people, just stupid. The internet euphoria was built by greed in terms of companies, people believing that they had this God-given right to tremendous wealth because they were associated with an internet company. If anybody had done any homework at all, it didn't, it, you would have seen this was the same thing all over. When an industry's hot, money piles into it because the people who are, are smart money right they figure they can pay attention to who else is buying and they know if there's enough greater fools coming in they have a way to get out And as long as the fools keep on rushing in they'll keep on buying because they're watching on a minute by minute day by day basis the internet euphoria was driven by driven by everyday individuals who thought they could invest and create their first million a second million a third million as a result of the new company that they think they might have discovered the whole stock market's a greater fool theory and you know 
for whatever reason, people didn't realize that. You guys say GIF or GIF? GIF. I say GIF. You're right. Well, okay. not actually, it's okay. I'm sorry? You know, that's, I'm back and forth on that one. GIF, typically. Sometimes I will throw the GIF in there. Depends on the mood I'm in. It depends on the day. <laughs> I say GIF and GIF. <laughs> it depends on who I'm talking to. I guess I say GIF. GIF, okay. We're, we're just asking everybody that. Um, we, one of the things that... GIF sounds too much like, uh, like Jiffy Popper, if I have to say GIF. Yeah. Most people go GIF, by the way, so you're, you're in good company. As long as I'm cool. GIF. GIF? GIF. GIF. Three GIFs in a row. Any re I mean... And I had no clue what that was for a really long time. So you... I thought those people that say GIF were just... They were techies and they were just being dumb. It's GIF. Dumb it's a techies. GIF. Yeah. Okay. No, not dumb techies. They were being dumb. Oh, okay. Techies are very smart. Do you say GIF or GIF? GIF. Generalized image format. That's you know what, what it's an abbreviation for. So it's generalized... Image. Image format. GIF. You, you mean GIF as in GIF, the picture format? I would say GIF. Would you, would you correct somebody if they said GIF? Uh, yes, I would. I probably would. If I, if I could and the circumstances were right and if I believed that you know, the other person would not uh, take, it, uh, take it in the wrong way. Do you have any rationale for why it should be GIF instead of GIF? I don't know, actually. I don't even know if that's the right. <laughs> but you would correct somebody. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. Having said that, yeah, I'm not sure that's... Well, what's the correct one? We don't know. <laughs> you know, I learned a lot talking to people about the dot-com bubble. But I don't think that our government actually learned anything. A few fines were levied here and there, but there were no real changes in the manner in which publicly traded companies were regulated. I wonder how many dot-coms, and Enrons for that matter, will occur before things really start to change. So, if it's not up to the government... It's a good place for inspiration, isn't it? It's up to us. How will future generations learn from our mistakes? We need a physical reminder, a monument to the dot-coms, so that one day we might build a more perfect internet. A monument to the dot-com economy. Uh, uh, <laughs> Take your time. Okay, a monument to the dot-com economy. Maybe uh, part of the symbol is the Dymaxion map of uh, Buckminster Fuller. Part of it might be the synaptic structure of the brain, or uh, maybe it's a virtual reality monument. I would say a big golden piggy bank with wooden nickels. Pyramid. Pyramid. Maybe it could just be the, the graph of the NASDAQ, because that is a pyramid. It's more like the Transamerica Tower, actually. In fact, maybe just rename the Transamerica Tower as... We'll rebrand something. Rebrand it as the internet boom and bust. I think it should be an 18-story delete key somewhere next to the pyramid in San Francisco, the Transamerica building, just a large delete key. Maybe it's not a physical monument. Maybe it's a monument that exists in cyberspace. Mm -hmm. Because in the future, uh, that's where people will be able to see it from all over the world. It would have to be uh, something that involves a circle. You see, this would work. This would work. I mean, it's, it's not big enough. It's like a model. But something really, uh, really basic, just black and, and low humming sounds and clicking sounds come from it. I mean, you know, I can imagine that it's sort of like found art, you know, when the guy put the toilet in the, in the museum. It, we could find a memorial. We don't even have to build anything. We could just find something and put a sign on it. Boom, it's done. A circle. Um, you know, whether it's, you know, just a walk where you go around like Mecca, you know, <laughs> going around <laughs> something, okay? Because yeah. everyone was attracted to it, and then you just simply find yourself walking in circles. It won't be easy to convince the powers that be to build a dot-com monument, since nobody really died in the bubble, except Timothy Leary. But we've got some really great ideas for monuments. People like this kind of thing. They can walk around on it. It's great. Sort of a, a long modem cable unplugged from a wall. You know, like, like a 10-foot high electric socket with like the cable unplugged. <laughs> Uh, an obelisk of, uh, you know, with little bitty names of all the dot-coms that were registered. 
and some really bad ideas. What material would you build it out of? PC. <laughs> Nobody's gonna wanna go to this monument. A fecal dot? I think it's a bull tagging a crap. <laughs> <laughs> the lungfish, I mean, was a, a, a critical part of the evolutionary game, right. you know. Coming out of the water. Coming out of the water, and like, there aren't lungfish around anymore, and yet, you know, you kind of look back down the line, it's hard for us to admit that our, you know, great-great-grandparents were lungfish, you know. <laughs> we have a much more highly <laughs> high view of ourselves, but, but in a sense, the dot-coms really are the genetic... Uh, uh, you know, parents of what's going to happen with these extraordinary science fiction realities that we're about to step into. I like it. I like it. This is the kind of thing I want to do. But mostly, we've got great ideas. The little lucite tombstone things, um, when you go public or when you do a big financing deal, they, they give you these, these, and I don't have, you know, I don't think I have any of them laying around still. Um, they're almost bad luck these days. <laughs> We are ourselves a product of some tremendous creative force called, which we've called evolution. Uh, and we can see in the fossil record this tremendous ability to spin out new forms and new capabilities on and on and on. And we're the current version of that. And then we've externalized now evolution into our tool making. So we can go back to, from levers and wheels right on through to the latest artificial intelligence algorithms. And the algorithm itself is a tool. And so um, you put all this together and you can kind of see here's a parallel evolutionary event taking place. And the dot coms are maybe the lungfish. Do you see what I mean? They're, they're a necessary transition step from individual computers to a network of synaptic intelligences that are going to form some kind of new global uh, mind or new kind of global intelligence which will interact with the human intelligence in ways that we can't yet predict. I think it should involve lots of people's business cards that they got. Yeah, um. here's mine. <laughs> <laughs> it should definitely have a swoosh in yes. it somewhere. A swirl or Some swoosh. kind of swoosh or something and it's got to talk. Chances are, bubbles are going to happen for as long as there are people and markets. Belief in exponential growth will lead to immature investments, and overfunded startup companies will spend their money on rooms full of toys. Unless we build our monument. <laughs>